Good evening, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Black Wealth Project. The Black Wealth Project is the ultimate think tank where a bunch of black folks sit around who are financially educated, financially, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Financially educated, have plenty of financial experience in areas like law, real estate, um, accounting, tax, and the whole nine. And so every week we're going to bring to you a different round table discussion about economic and financial topics that are actually happening in the, in our community, the black community. I'm Kamara Ellis. I am here with my wonderful team. I have Corey from By the Hood. I have Courtney from the Ivy Investor. I have Malik, the real estate coach, you know, Cobbs Creek Leak. And we have Jimmy from By the Hood as well. So everybody starting with Corey, since you are immediately to my right, Introduce yourself and let everybody know who you are. Hey, I'm Corey. Um, you know, Philadelphia born and bred. I got crazy amount of experiences uh, in the financial fields. Um, I'm a teacher by by trade, um, but what I do on a daily basis right now is I'm in the markets making money. I do, you know, all kinds of stuff in the markets. I, you know, buy and hold. I do cover calls, naked calls, vertical spreads, all anything you could do to make money in the markets. I don't. Um, and so, you know, that's what my experiences experiences are. Uh, I've been poor uh, for a lot of my life. I had more money than I knew what to do with for a long a portion of my life. And so, I have a perspective, you know, that that, that spans the gamut. Okay. Thanks, Corey. Hey, Courtney, tell us about yourself. Hey, I am Courtney Richardson, the Ivy, founder of the Ivy Investor. I've been running and teaching women how to invest for the last, I don't know, I, I feel like it's a long time, but I guess it's like last six years. I was a stockbroker, licensed stockbroker, Series 7, Series 66, Life Accident and Health uh, from 2003 to 2013. I lived through the stock market crash 2008. Um, I lived to tell the story. I, I was laid off. And then I went over to law school, became a, a real estate attorney, did uh, wealth management. And uh, here we are. All righty. Malik? Yeah, uh, Malik Carter, once again. Uh, I am a realtor, a real estate investor. Uh, I do buy and holds, uh, flips, and my first time developing property outside of Philadelphia. Right now, I have a project in North Carolina that I'm um, working on becoming an expert in that state also. And I was a mortgage loan officer and a mortgage broker and a mortgage banker uh, starting with 05 until uh, 08. And um, I lost everything at 08. And, and now I'm back. Gotcha. Jimmy? Yeah, so I'm Jimmy, uh, the founder of By the Hood, Corey's partner at By the Hood. Um, my experience is primarily in real estate. I've been in real estate for over 20 years at this point. Um, you know, started as a teenager, did everything from being a clerical staff to a real estate agent to an assessor to a real estate modeler, developer, landlord. So it runs the gamut with real estate, but I also have stock market experience. Um, author of two books, Own Your Time and Space. You can get it at ownyourtimeandspace.com and also a book called Sports the Book. Go to sportsthebook.com. And I just want to say before we start that uh, Malik has inspired me, right? So I do own some artwork, so I want to show it, right? <laughs> but but I haven't hung it up. But, but, but I haven't hung it up yet, right? But like you know, being on calls, with, I'm on calls with Malik all the time, on, and like now, and I'm seeing his artwork, and I feel bad. I'm like, I gotta get like you know. So Malik, I pulled my artwork out. I'm about to get some hooks now. So hey, we gotta you know. get creative. Listen, listen, listen. You know, I was I was thinking today, not to get too far off, that we. We don't have a community of the business, the sciences, and the arts. They're all separated. There's no platform where we bring all three together. That's a great point. And I and I and the funny thing is, I support black artists. So like every piece of art I have primarily is um by African American artists. And I just been lazy because I've been working. I'm like, but now I see yours looking all great <laughs> behind you. So I like I told my wife I gotta pull this out. I gotta get some hooks because when we do these shows, I gotta make sure I represent. You know what I mean? <laughs> It's your job to give us all a little bit of culture, all right? <laughs> we 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 going to be the new Black Renaissance. Hey, there listen, we have to be. We have to be. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, everybody. So now that you've met everybody except for me, I am Kamari Ellis, 
Many people call me the finance rebel. I'm a financial strategist and tax advisor. Been in the financial services industry for over 20 years, doing everything from accounting and tax to financial planning and also institutional slash Wall Street investing. So we've got a diverse team, but it's a team that's committed to the black community. It's a team that loves the black community. And it's a team that wants to see the black community do way better, especially when it comes to their finances. Because right now, as it stands, we generate roughly $1.2 trillion in spending. Now, that's a lot of money. However, when you break it down per average, it's not a whole, whole lot. And then when you couple that with the black and white wealth gap, which, you know, on any given day might be black folks having a, a net worth of $11,000, roughly we're rounding up here, and white Americans having a net worth of roughly 144000 it shows that we need to do something. We need to do something now. And we need to be very aggressive and assertive about whatever that something is going to be. So every week we'll be talking about this. Please share this with your family. Anybody who's looking to increase their overall financial IQ, anybody who's looking for different opportunities, because we're not only just going to use this platform to, you know, talk about technical financial terms. We're also going to use this platform to big up other platforms. And as I talk about that, today's highlighted business of the week is going to be presented by Courtney. Courtney, tell us about the business you want to highlight this week, the black owned business that you want to highlight this week. So the black owned business that I am highlighting this week is Mosaic Development Partners. They are a black owned development firm, real estate development firm. Um, they have been doing some amazing projects all over the southeastern part of the state. So super excited about them. Um, from what I understand, when COVID gets, we get it all together from COVID, they're going to have some really big movers and shakers. I was introduced from by Mosaic by one of my really good sorority sisters, a good friend of mine, Tracy Powell. She is um, a real estate agent and she really speaks highly of them. So I um, wanted to big up Mosaic. They have some huge projects that are going on and I believe that they're working with uh, Cheney University also. So mm, nice. up to them. Shout out to Tracy. Shout out to Mosaic. They're doing their thing in the city of Philadelphia. All right. So listen, tonight's topic is going to be the black community. How does the black community navigate COVID? But before we jump into that, I want to just talk about something a little bit, right? So we all kind of had a conversation yesterday about someone who got some COVID funds, some PVP funds, and PVP stands for <laughs> Payroll Protection Program. Mm -hmm. And they took that money and they did some crazy things about it. Now, who talked about that? Was that you, Jimmy, yesterday that brought that up? No, no Malik brought it up. But, uh, Malik, uh, you know, Malik, what, what happened? This guy was in Atlanta, right? Right. He was in Atlanta. I don't want to. He was in Atlanta, you know, supposedly a reality TV show guy. I don't know for sure, but I think they said that he had a trucking company and he applied for a loan of three point two million and um, was awarded. Allegedly was awarded two million dollars and allegedly spent a one and a half million dollars in less than seven days. Um, so but I mean, he lived really like good. Man. He was trying to like run through it. Yeah, he definitely he was definitely like Montgomery Brewster. <laughs> he was the, let's see, he ran through like one and a half million in uh five to seven days, allegedly. You know, so you know, uh, I, honestly, I was talking to somebody. I think that I think they'll be fine actually. You know, because ultimately, right? You know, he's supposed to. It, it's still a loan. You know, you're supposed to use use the money for what you want to use it for. But people misuse funds all the time as far as loans. And as long as his goal was to pay it back, I really don't see a reason why he was he'll do like real fed time for it, except to be made an example of. Well, I, I see. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a minute. <laughs> hold on, let, let's, uh -oh, uh -oh. Let's, let's break this down. Got the right. attorney ready to talk. Yeah, yeah, please. Everybody, please do. Everybody's been talking about PPP, right? Payroll Protection Program as part of the uh, the CARES Act that just came out. I forget how many billions of dollars that was allocated to that. And it's basically for the SBA or the Small Business uh, Administration to help bail out small businesses. And we've seen all kinds of shenanigans with it. Everybody from the Lakers mm -hmm. to Ruth Chris to many other big, big, big um, corporations, billion dollar corporations getting this money. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And so I find it ironic because the guy, what Malik didn't tell y'all is that what the guy brought was he brought a whole bunch of cars. He brought a whole bunch of jewelry, mm-hmm. right? He really ran off with the plug on this one. And, he, he, brought, he brought a wraith, right. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And so... Allegedly, allegedly. I don't know. Yes, allegedly. <laughs> and so when, he, uh, when, when he was raided, they found a whole lot of cash. I want to say over $100,000 per cash. However, I just brought up the point about all these other corporations that kind of got away with doing something similar. Some folks gave the money back. Some have not. But I know Courtney's ready to jump in because there's an aspect of the law that I am sure she wants to talk about. So well, please, Courtney. No, 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 no. We're not going to go into the aspect of the law. But at the end <laughs> of the day, you were supposed to use it for business mm-hmm. purposes. Business mm-hmm. purposes ain't flexing, baby. That ain't it. <laughs> so right, I mean, except except for he was a reality star, right? If that if I he's mean, going to get, if he's going to get more gigs and be able to hire more people to even even if he hire um. Uh, a, a web people, right? Somebody to manage manage his social media account. He's the, his business is in the public eye. So I think he has a defense. I could, you know, I'm not an attorney. No, but yeah, no. You know, you well, just... well, hold on though. Let's let's just say. <laughs> I see it right now. I mean, I mean, let's just like all right. So, so, so my brother Corey, like he records all the time from his car, right? Mm-hmm. So suppose he wanted to do some recording and he just happened to want to do his in a race. You know what I mean? Like, you know, um, is, is you know, Corey's car is considered a business expense, expense, right? Ordinary and necessary <laughs> business expense that is in the IRC, the, the internal oh, revenue. IRC. Okay, let me. Okay, now listen, I'm gonna concede to that, right? Okay. Now, but the Catholic, a lot of Catholic churches also got a lot of money from the PPP loan. Understand? So, mm-hmm. are they all getting locked up? All them priests and all them parish front, like, are they getting locked up? Wait a minute. They're oh. not. So wait a minute, wait a minute. So this is something I see. This is why I brought this up because I knew it would be true. Right. right? We like to mix and match stuff. Mm-hmm. Right? The Catholic Church has staff. They have employees. Now let's go back to the alleged charge. It was for his trucking company. So the payroll protection funds or program is for payroll. Now, Malik, your loophole could say could be is that he took all this stuff as payroll. I doubt it. I seriously doubt it. But that's the loophole. And I know that's what Courtney was about to get you at. But go ahead. <laughs> go ahead with the I think you really covered it. I mean, at the end of the day, he was supposed to get it for his trucking company. So his ordinary necessary expenses and payroll regard necessary to his trucking company. So so player, you ended up getting it around your neck and getting getting a a car with payroll funds. Like, like so let's put this in perspective for something that we may have had experience with. So student loan money. So a lot of people get these refund checks uh, with student loans and they go do things, whatever. But you're actually, per the, the loan requirements, not supposed to use it for anything else other than uh, educational related expenses. So No say, comment. Listen, <laughs> I'm, I'm saying I'm saying absolutely nothing about that. This is fine. I, listen, I, listen, I don't know how long I have on that clock, so I'm going to say... I'm giving you the rules. That's it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, we talked about coloring it in the lines yesterday. So my, what I'm saying to you generally is that when these loans have, when you're getting loans, especially from the government, they they have attachments. There's there's rules and regulations. You have to do this. You have to do that. And if you don't, then you have a problem. So he has a problem now. How this is how this turns out, I don't know. What. I, I really, I, I hope it doesn't turn out for him poorly. I hope he just gets a chance to return the stuff and everybody kind of just walks away and we're good. Um, but I'm, my concern is, is that the prosecution to the point that you made earlier is that are they are they going to try to make an example of, of him? Like, listen, y'all get these funds and you cut up. This is what's going to happen to you. So that, that is my concern. So I, I don't know. He was, he was going to use it for something and he didn't. And this here we are. So here's a question for the room, and I kind of teased it a little bit, right? They were on him like literally split when he got those funds. Mm-hmm. And I'm not trying to justify what he did. Why are major corporations suffering the same type of investigation or getting the same type of investigation? Well, here's the first thing is that when you go and buy a car in cash, you have to fill out federal forms. 
Like when you drop cash at the car dealership, they're like, oh, that's cute. Even when you drop cash at the at the bank, if you do over ten thousand dollars, you have to fill out a form. Nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine. Yeah, I've I've actually I actually had to fill those forms out because I put a car in cash, a house in cash, and I've had to. I put large deposits of money into the bank and I had to fill out federal forms every single time. But that's right. But that's the thing right there. So yeah, you're like, Oh, they were on him lickety split. Well, sir, you had to fill out a whole bunch of paper at no point. Did you think, you know what, you know, y'all, y'all clocking me kind of heavy. Let me pull back. No, he didn't do that. But I don't think he got a chance to, I'm not going to rush the judgment. We don't know where to, you know, maybe he was co-mingling the funds some way. I don't know the circumstances. He might have already, he might have already had a million dollars. I mean, he did have a business. He was on shows. It might already been his bread that he could have put in that account to leverage it. I don't know, but you know, we'll, we'll see. I'm not, I'm not going to crucify him, but it's, it's looking bad. It is looking bad though. Well, I don't want to crucify him either. Listen, I to me, I, I think we made we we made another point that says, well, everybody else does it, you know, blah blah blah. And what about us? Why are we always coming under getting the boom? Well, there's certain things that you have to learn the game and you have to play it better than anyone else. And that's like the rule, <laughs> period. So I, to me, I'm like, if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna do it, then structure it in a certain way. I don't suggest you do it generally, but you you can't just be out there. But I, but but kind of to the point of COVID is when 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 white America gets the flu, when white America gets a cold, Black America gets the flu. So we always get it two times worse, and that's what's going on with COVID too. So it's just again, I get where we come from. Like, why are we under the microscope just more so than everybody else? Why does everybody care what we're doing? I know I think it sucks too, but understanding that that means you need to move differently. And so I mean, that was that was really why I brought it up, Courtney. So when you say move differently. Expound on that, please. Who? Well, where? Where? Where do you want me to start? I don't know. <laughs> just, just do shit right. I mean, I mean, know that we are always targets. Yes. Right. We have always been tar- targets historically. Mm-hmm. So, our sentencing, we can start at elementary school with the rate of black children being suspended is a higher rate than everybody else. Our rate of incarceration is is higher than everybody else. For the same level of crime, um, we get locked up for "quote unquote" white collar crime. I believe more than than everybody else, and our wealth levels are lower than everybody else. I mean, there's several correlations there. So I would think, from a strategic standpoint, from a strategic standpoint, no matter what lifestyle or business that you're in, right? Because this is a no judgment zone. You got to move accordingly, like you said. And that come and get me. <laughs> Are right, we going to come back? <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I know. I, I, listen, man, I live now, in the neighborhood. That's how they think. Hold on. You're going to get the floor. But here's the thing. Most times when we get caught up, when we say come and get me, we don't have the lawyer money. I was going to say that. Mm-hmm. And so when we when we get on that vibe, we can't win that. Nine times out of ten. Unless you're OJ. And we saw what happened with OJ. He wound up messing up anyway. They came and got him 10 years later, 20 years later, but they came and got him. I understand, but I, I'm, I'm just telling you the mentality of the people that's, that's doing this. Like, come get me. Yeah, like, I know. That is like, the mentality. I, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to go get it, and if they if they catch me, they catch me. Like, they don't plan on living forever. They don't plan on living till they 70. Right. So if I'm, going, if I'm going to go do it, I'm, I might as well live, you know, I might as well live large. Right. Because if I'm going to live short, I might as well live large. Okay. So that's the mm-hmm. that's the mentality of those folks. That's a really good point. And I, I want to use that. I don't think I'm gonna live until 70. I want to I want to use that because in terms of like some of the things that we need to be doing is that we need to be estate planning. I one of the things that I have noticed that we don't estate plan, you know, they're like, oh, I can't take it with me, you know, or whatever the case may be, and then it ends up getting so messy and we end up losing wealth in that process of death. We're so busy. Not only are we so busy grieving and dealing with the emotions of death, we're not able to deal with the business of death. So it just causes a lot of problems. So in terms of like the things that we should be doing better, that's something that we need to be doing better. You are going to die. Yes. Can you take the stuff with you? No. But what are you going to do to put your family in a better position than when you when you leave than when you when you before you left? Because one of the things that I've noticed that people putting somebody in the ground, like burying them, it's like 
anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars. And if it's anywhere mm-hmm. from five to ten thousand dollars, if your family does not have that, the least you can do is have a burial plan. So you don't put your family in a five to ten thousand dollar hole beyond what they already have going on. And then it's just right, crazy. And Go ahead. I just want to say something to that um, because uh, what I see all the time is people losing grandma's house, right? So grandma knows that she should be buying property or having assets. And once grandma goes, um, people don't take care of what they need to, right? Mm-hmm. So grandma may have a bunch of kids. She leaves it to all the kids at the one time, which, you know, I'm not an estate planner, but in my experience, that always causes problems, leaving it to, you know, four and five people. They can't decide what to do with it. And next thing you know, they're not paying the taxes. And, you know, um, and Corey can speak to this. I've seen grandmothers who have bought multiple properties on one block, own half a block. And when grandmom goes, they lose that wealth, a lot of wealth. Right. So we talk about um, the racial wealth gap. We talk about what we do have, what we don't have. But I wonder how much wealth we lose on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting. If someone did a study on that, how much wealth do we actually lose? Because people die intestate, mm-hmm. um, don't have plans, don't name beneficiaries, and lose property. That's a yeah. good. That's, that's a cool. great question. Um, we probably should do a whole show on estate planning and that conversation overall. But tonight we're going to talk about the state of the black economy during COVID. But before we jump into that, we were having a conversation about Corey and his mobile podcast studio so not only does Corey do this show Corey, like jimmy said is co-founder of by the hood by the hood podcast everybody go check that out um every time jimmy and Corey do an episode Corey's always in the car and so i think courtney brought up is that a tax write-off so i have to look that up personally you clearly can write off mileage right but as a home office or like a mobile office, I, I don't know. I don't see why not. I don't see why you couldn't write it off as mobile office. Hey, listen, I'm I told, I already told this. I'm coming. I'm, I'm going to find out in January. When I, <laughs> Look I'm, at y'all. I'm I told going, you, I'm y'all, y'all, y'all brought that up to the wrong person. Hey, hey, I'm going to find out in January. So that's another point. That's another point. No, no, no. We don't find stuff out in January because after January is done, you can't do nothing about it. The tax year is over. We no, no. I'm talking about. I'm talking about writing it off when I do my tax. When the taxes get done. No, let's let's plan. No, no. We we tax plan. That's another thing about planning. Like, <laughs> All right. We're tax plan. We're tax planning. We're, we're planning. We're not going to get surprised in January. We're not doing that. That's 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 old. That's old old school. We don't do that no more. Okay. You, okay. You, you tell okay. me. All right. Since you, you you tell me how I'm going to do it. I'm going to stop talking. You're going to tell me how I'm going to do it. I'm going to shut up and let you tell me how to do it. But I'm going to find out. Hey, Either listen. Way. Next, next <laughs> week we all be in our cars on the podcast. <laughs> you already know. Now it's, now, now, it's time, now it's time to upgrade the car, right? Exactly. <laughs> now, now, now you need to rate. Now you need to rate right now. I'm going to walk across my driveway and get in my 2020 and see if I can get the right off on that one instead of this now, old now, beat up job. Yeah, now it's, now it's time to put some stars in the ceiling, Malik. <laughs> all right, hold on. So. Listen, it's going to be a little bit different. We're also going to interact with our, our viewing audience every week as well. So um, it looks like one of our commenters, I don't want to say their name, but it looks like one of our commenters that I trust uh, emphatically says that he can use it for business use. However, wouldn't it, how would that be different than mileage or actual cost on the vehicle? Because there's no rent. Unless we're going to say the car payment, if he, if he indeed has a car payment, or lease payment. There's no payment on this one. So I'm going to get in the up. Playing it all out. I'm just playing it all out. So, but yeah, it looks like you can do it. But to Courtney's point, um, one of the things that's a pet peeve of mine is you can't tax plan during tax season. Please don't do that, folks. If there's one thing you take away from today's show, start thinking about a tax plan now. But anyway, moving right along to our main topic. All right. The state of the black economy during COVID. I want to start off with Jimmy this time. What do you think about the state of the economy or the black economy during COVID, Jimmy? Um, I think that Courtney, uh, I don't want to quote her wrong. You said you said when they catch a cold, we get the flu. Yeah. Um, that's a fact. That, that that's that's a quote of I'm gonna quote you on that. That's kind of hard. But um, when they catch a cold, we get the flu, and, and that's absolutely true. So um 
just talking to business owners right now, they're struggling. Um, and some were already struggling, but this to me should be a lesson in a lot of things, right? It should be a lesson in, in, in terms of reserves. It should be a lesson in, um, in terms of doing for self. No one's going to take you uh, instead of looking, you know, for handouts. But to me, the lesson in reserves, and I say that because a lot of the business owners I talk to are landlords or people in the real estate business. And I'm shocked the amount of landlords that I talk to that were, you know, one or two rent payments away from their entire, um, fortune crumbling and these are some people that have multiple properties you know i'm talking 20 shopping? 30 40 properties um because of I, I guess because of my experience like after going through 08 like you know at some point you have to smarten up right you know and understand that you should have reserves and also the way i run my business when you build out you know your, your net operating income you should always put up for expenses and reserves and i'm shocked at the amount of people that don't put up for reserves who, when they get their rent check, they pay their bills and the rest, they just go spend, um, you know, to each his own. But generally, if you're trying to build wealth, you shouldn't be living off of your rents per se, unless you put up for expenses. So it goes it, to me, what I'm taking from this, from my standpoint, from the real estate guy, is that a lot of landlords and people within that business need to understand how to, you know, um, determine what their expenses are, determine what their actual income is. Because now they're looking back and they're recognizing like, okay, money's moving so fast. I'm not actually even making money on these properties by the time, um, you know, you, you put up for certain things. So now they have to reevaluate their entire business, which goes to her original point. When they catch a cold, we catch the flu because it's going to affect us a lot different. Um, it's already more difficult for us to borrow. So that's going to change coming out of this. Um, you have data on a, a certain banks that they changed their lending requirements. That's going to affect us different. We're going to get the flu with that in terms of being able to borrow, to, to be able to get out of the hole that's being dug now. So I don't think that we've seen the end of, you know, this quote unquote flu that we're going to catch because it's going to get bad as time moves on. All right. All right. Malik. All right. So, I mean, of course, I'm always the stop buying shit guy. It doesn't matter whether the whether economy is good or the economy is bad. You know, I just don't think people should spend. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm just not a spender, and I understand how I was able to leverage up and do things because I had money available from not spending on certain things, right? So that's always my stance, no matter what's going on. But I'll say this: the, um, the poorest people will be just fine uh, with COVID. I mean, you know, most of us, you know, we. We've made do with almost nothing for a long period of time. It'll be just fine. The problem are the people that make decent money. Like when it's time to move up, like the, there's going to be plenty of there'll be jobs available, but they'll be paying less money, right? There, a lot of corporations are going to take this time to reduce what they offer, especially if they, now that they can offer a work from home salary now to value at the position, you really goes down as far as as far as how much they're willing to pay could come down because the opportunity to work from home. So, you know, there are some of those things. So people that work in the corporate world where a job might pay, you know, 110, 120, that might come down to 85, 90, you know, with, with these things. And so I said that's always going to affect, you know, people of color because we're really not in in hiring positions. I think I saw a stat that out of the 36 million people that uh, fought for unemployment due to COVID, uh, 80% are people that made less than $40,000, right? And, mm. you know, that's less largely, you know, people in like middle, lower income neighborhoods, right, are making $40,000 or less. And so it's going to affect us that way. But all in all, to getting by, yeah, get getting by will be it'll be just fine. Like the barber shops still gonna be filled up. You know the hair salon still gonna be, you know, filled up. We don't own any grocery stores anyway, right? And so it's not really gonna be affected or any clothing stores, any suppliers. You know, we just don't really have a lot of businesses that are gonna be affected. Now, what what would hurt is I saw Mayor Kenny talking about potentially laying off some city employees, and that's going to devastate you know uh, black folk if that happened. I, I hope that doesn't happen. You know, I, I always vote against the bond referendums, but if they, you know, if they have to raise money for a bond to keep some employees, I might might vote for that one this time. 
So yeah, well, they already the city already laid off uh, folks already. City of Philadelphia. Late, late, well, can laid I off. Uh, well, I want to yeah. add something to that point, Kamari, about what he just made real fast. Um, because what you said about uh, people in the higher income brackets um, having to take pay cuts, right? So when Twitter decided that they would allow their employees to just work from home indefinitely, I um, was watching CNBC, and it was a gentleman from a um, tech company. I can't think which tech company it was. He said, but the conversations in Silicon Valley that they realize is, why are we paying for this office space? Because now companies are realizing how many, of these, how many of these jobs could have been done from home anyway? And the second piece they realize is if we can have people work remotely, we can actually lower the salaries because the pool of people can actually pull from becomes so much bigger. So I think that could be problematic for us as well. When you start to see them pull from a lot of these companies that will have jobs now that will become work from home and they'll get people to work from home all over the world. It doesn't necessarily have to be someone living in Silicon Valley or even – um. There was another gentleman on that uh, panel who was uh, from Texas, and he was talking about the, the tech industry, f- <clears throat> excuse me, figuring out the same thing over there. Now we have a bigger pool of applicants, and we're going to lower the salaries, but I'll still fill the same positions to get the same amount of work done. So I think that could be problematic. Well, and also, also let me add to that, Jimmy, is I think the city of Philadelphia has a huge number of people that don't even have internet in their home. They use their phones, right? So I think it's it's like 30%. It's like a, it's a really high yeah, number. We, of we people. have a huge number. Yeah, we do. We do. We have a huge number. You know, so we can't even, people can't even get those work from home positions without a steady internet, you know, and then how you work from home, you know, if you have like multiple generations, right, in a, at home, you know, you can't be a, a, a telemarketer, right, in a way, and work from home with the kids, you know, in other room screaming, you know, so there, there's a, you, you're going to need a big enough space so you can have pretty much silence, like a personal office. And that's going to be, you know, so there's some challenges, man. And and we'll, so we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. It's going to be rough, though. All right. Yeah. Corey. Uh, I, what I'm noticing is that, uh, you know, people are becoming more, I, I, I would say, uh, like, they 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 they're getting on their hustle game, you know what I mean? Like they they they, they seen that they need side hustles before, but now it's becoming apparent that you have to have one. Like that, no job is safe. You know, people that I know that, that that had so-called safe jobs, like teachers and stuff like that, is getting laid off. And now they're saying that, that that's not the only thing that you can and should be doing. Um, and so with this COVID-19 um, has taught me about the state of the black economy is that because we've had to do so much differently. So, you know, for so long that people have already become, you know, they people already got side hustles. They just started amping them up. So, and then I seen a lot of people get PPP off of their side hustles. You know what I mean? They had that little small side hustle business running and they was like, look, I'm going to go grab some of this PPP money as an employee of my own business. So, uh, you know, I've actually seen it on the other side. No, nobody copped the race, but (laughs) (laughs) they, they, I've seen it on the other side too. Um, Also, um, there's, there's businesses that thrive in in bad times. We need to start thinking about building those kind of businesses that thrive in bad times, that do okay in good times and thrive in bad times. Businesses like Walmart and Amazon, this is like Walmart and Amazon, dollar stores and, 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 and um, discount stores thrive in these bad times. A company like Clorox thrived in this bad time, you know. Um, and so building thriving businesses that, that thrive during bad times, you know, actually uh, farming, right? You know, a lot of farmers, the uh, farms are going, they're going shooting right past the, um, the, the main thing they're going direct to people right now mm-hmm. so you you there's there's ways to to maneuver through this we just have to figure out you know and, and build the businesses that can maneuver through these kind of bad times because every every economy is cyclical and so we need to start building things that that create money during these cyclical times you know um you know learning about the stock market, you can see how what companies thrive and what companies take a, a nosedive during these, during these thriving times, and we need to build those kind of businesses. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. 
consumer defensive. Yep, that's what the sector's called. Yep, absolutely. A lot of those more black farms too. Yeah, a lot of I mean a lot of a lot of those consumer defensive joints are getting kicked in the face too, but is they not getting kicked as hard? I mean, because you know every business has customers because businesses solve problems. But the thing about that mm-hmm. is, if you're solving, but you are right. You know, Looking at the consumer defensive sector, um, you'll like find a lot of those businesses. Yeah, you'll find a lot of those businesses. Jimmy, you brought up something. You said consumer defensive sector, right? So I know what that is. Mm-hmm. But explain to the audience what that is. Yeah, it's a sector. When you when you look at the stock market and look at uh, uh, companies, um, they're put in different sectors. And the consumer defensive sector, that's the sectors that people uh, will do business with or support, like throughout whatever phase we're in. Like Corey said, there's always ups and downs in our overall economy. But um, companies that sell things like toilet tissue or um, like Clorox is a great example. Um, products that you're going to have to use. You know, um, and people that people do use, whether the economy is doing, um, you know, great or not. So, uh, uh, Corey is right, and, and I didn't even think about the whole idea of farming, like a black black farms, like you know, something that we sh- that's something we should probably look into as well. Um, how to create more black farms? I mean, black farmers kind of get a they they got a rough deal. Um, one of the things I think we should be doing, and Malik, I want to give Malik credit for this because. Mm-hmm. Even though Malik, he, he be trying it to pays you so much to give me credit for anything, I guess. <laughs> like he, he, he's so good and he's so street, but he really is a scholar, right? So Malik said years ago that we need to start looking into urban farming more. So I, I do want to give him his credit for saying that because I know he was one of the first people that ever said that to me. Because, um, I mean, like most of us are from Philly. I know we have viewers from all over. But if you look in Philly and how many lots there are, mm-hmm. and nobody's ever coming to get them anytime soon, they could easily be confirmed. Oh, I'm mm-hmm. coming. So coming. The land bank may be taken. Now, yeah, but well, how and that's here's the thing. So every every, I I thought I looked into that before, and um, I was warned to be careful because of uh, you know, and this this is going to get into politics, but. The zoning is difficult to get everything zoned to be able to do what you have to do. So you don't want to put a, a huge investment into this vacant lot just to have, you but know, the government come tell you if to you, leave it alone. You and you're it, right about if you do it in Chester, you'd be just fine. Nobody's going to bother you. <laughs> you do it in Chester. But, <laughs> no, let me, Link, I'm gonna give you the props too, though, because you were on it earlier. I remember like last year when we had our camp, and you were telling me about like um, you know, like like fish, like you were talking you know, about even the way to get aquaponics. fish. Like, Aquaponics, right? You know, that's my yeah. Listen. Aquaponics. That's what that's what you were talking about. Aquaponics. Listen, yeah, you were put me if, down with if that. If I like, had what? If I had enough, like right now, it takes a lot to build like a business. If I had enough money, I would a hundred percent build aquaponics farm right now. Like, if, I would love to do that. What kind I, of capital actually, does that take? I was thinking about it. So you know, yeah, actually, you know, you know, you know, Dr. Claude Anderson has one in Maryland. Right. To well, do hold, it. First off, can you explain to our audience? Can you explain to our audience what that what exactly that is? Because I was so, blown away when you told me this. I got you. So, so aquaponics is right where people do it a lot. The reason why you see a lot of tilapia and a lot of catfish all of a sudden on the market is because those fish thrive in dirty water, right? So other fish will die. You can pack a bunch of them in a small space. Um, it's not because of franken fish or fake fish. It's not. These are real fish, right? but they can just grow in dirty water. So they do is they have a fish tank and the water comes out of the fish tank into a flower bed and you can do do it without dirt. You don't need dirt at all to grow whatever flowers, plants, whatever. And the water coming from the fish tank all, you know, has their waste in it. So it's like super fertilizer for the plants. And then the plants suck up all of the, those nutrients and that bad stuff. And then fresher water cycles back into the fish tank, you know, so it was one big system. So we could grow weed with the fish. We could have weed fish. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I was thinking, I was thinking more potatoes, I mean, uh, and, and tomatoes, not necessarily weed, but no, but you definitely could grow weed very quickly right with the uh aquaponics and, and no dirt and that's why that's what i'm saying like forget the dirt you don't need the, you need the dirt you just need the warehouse because you can do this whole system without without dirt well i think you, know, you, have you to just, remember about dirt like dirt isn't just i mean dirt adds something to the party so if you have weed that was done in a hydroponics setting or 
um, a non a non soil setting, it's going to taste different. So I, I think there's something to be said. It's not like, oh, dirt doesn't just, you know, whatever, you know, it doesn't matter. It does matter. But I think it, to your point, it just depends on how, what we're looking to grow and how we're looking to grow it. But Tracy said in the comments, you know, we do need to control, you know, what and how we eat in our, in our process of getting the distribution. Because I think one of the bigger things that we have in terms that we haven't talked about yet is that a lot of African-Americans live in what we consider food deserts. Right. And we're having we're starting to see that we're having a shortage of food. And one of the things that we've also and what we because people aren't working because like Tyson had to shut down their plant because everybody had COVID. Um, but some of the things that I thought were really interesting is that the African-American community health wise is being disproport disproportionately affected for a couple of reasons. One of the big reasons is that we don't tend to present symptoms like everybody else. So, I mean, and we know that from our interactions with diabetes, high blood pressure. I don't know if you've ever had one of your family members say, hey, you know, I went to the doctor and my blood, my blood sugar was 400 and they said I should have been in a coma and I felt fine. And the same thing with high blood pressure, same kind of idea. My blood pressure was XYZ or XYZ. They said I should have stroked out, but I feel fine. So again, we're not presenting the same way. So that's the first thing. There's a lot of people that got turned away when they were experiencing the initial um, effects of COVID and they were turned away because they weren't sick enough. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is that we have comorbidities that uh, which are um, obesity, diabetes, and there's a couple others that are rampant in the in the black community. Courtney, what does comorbidity mean? Basically, that something I guess it's like another type of disease that can cause you problems okay. I guess, or something that causes that causes the problem. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I knew what it meant. <laughs> I like that. I like that definition. Something that causes you problems. <laughs> yeah, but I'm an attorney. I'm not a doctor. But it's a a disease that will enhance or has or cause more difficulties in another um, in in the COVID. I guess getting COVID. So if I have diabetes, I'm more likely to die if right. I get COVID. So that's really what it is. So the explanation and definition, there's your example. So I, I think those are the things, but to the point of food is that a lot of the things that we are suffering as a community are, is an indirect result of the food or, or the nutrients or lack thereof in our communities. So I, I think that's kind of the way to bring it back to say, you know, we, we do have some real serious problems and we do need to take control of what we can while, while we actually have the downtime. I mean, how many things can you learn while you're sitting at home? Now, granted, I know to the point of like living with three generations, it's a lot and you have a lot going on. But if you do have a, the ability to get another skill, that's going to serve you better in kind of the post-COVID world. Because I think the thing is, is that as we're looking at COVID, we have to look to the future to see what is the post-COVID world going to look like and how am I going to be affected? And I know everybody said that, oh, the service professions are going to be fine, but are they? Because a lot of people are learning how to cut them. My fiance learned how to cut his own hair. And I was like, well, wait a second now. So <laughs> my, my question is, is that some of the things that we were going to a professional, we realized, okay, well, I can do this myself. So, and then, it, and again, our, a lot of people's income is going to be reduced. I mean, we have so-called safe jobs are now getting laid off or furloughed. So they're saying, well, I, you know, there's still things that I need to do or I can reduce my expenses by doing it myself. So some ser service industries are not going to fare well at all. Now, I can't say all of them, but in certain cases they won't. So the question is, is that how do we become defensive in our movements. You know, there's a lot of places that are going to need coding. There's going to a lot of places that are going to need uh, trucking. Logistics is still going. You know, we, we yeah. still have truckers going all over the United States. So should you be getting your, your I don't know, it's like a class A license? I don't know. Should you be doing something like that? So it's about creating a better economy for yourself on the other side, especially if you're already furloughed or laid off right now. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. That's a, that's a so um, I want to, Kamari. Just to, I just want to say I got. I just want to give you real quick, Kamari. I got an inbox. I'm, I'm not going to put their name out there, but um, the city is is going to announce their first layoffs on June 1st. So that's coming up um, when they announce yeah. whether they whether they'll have to or, or what they're going to do. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, but and, and also, um, I like what, I like I'm what Courtney sure was saying that, and I just want to. No, I was saying I'm sure many other municipalities, right, will be experiencing the same mm -hmm. thing. Because everybody's missing out on tax revenue right now, so cities and states. Yeah, I was gonna say, 
in terms of solutions, I like to be solutions based. And uh, Courtney was talking about some of the things that we should be looking at, not just how bad we're doing. We all know that we're going to, um, you know, get the brunt of this. But what should we be doing moving forward? Like, what are some of the solutions? And as Malik was talking, he talked about uh, having multiple generations in the home, not being able to do that. Is there going to be um, an opportunity for, you know, um, something along the lines of like WeWorks, but, you know, in our communities where we can have locations for people to come and do you know, um, the quote unquote work from home, if, you know, if, will that be an opportunity? That's I mean, something that we can build. <laughs> I mean, one exists already in Philadelphia right now. Shout out to uh, Pipeline. Um, that's black. Mm -hmm. Um, but that, and I know there's some other, you know, I can't speak for other cities. I'm sure there's some other things going on in those areas as well, but I think that's actually a great idea. The question again will be though, is will they be able to follow CDC guidelines with safe distancing and everything else? And how well will they able, be able to do that? Because to do something like that, you need decent infrastructure. Mm -hmm. No, I, I definitely agree. And I think, but, but I think that goes to the next point that we've been talking about for a while is about what industries are going to feel the brunt of it. And real estate is actually feeling the brunt of it, but not in the ways that we ideally think about real estate. Now, so Courtney, hold that. Hold hold that for one second. We're gonna to get to that. I wanna I wanna I wanna shift real quick. Um and it's not a shift, right? But I wanted to talk I'm about more kind of uh, there you go. Oh yeah, sorry. I had the wrong button. <laughs> so black unemployment right now. We all know that black unemployment always is higher than the national average. Right now, the national average is approximately 14.7%. 36 million people have been laid off. I forget the exact number in April, but I believe it's upwards of 20 million. And so we're seeing all these people being laid off. We're seeing beef shortages, chicken shortages. Um, and we're seeing, obviously, black unemployment is higher than the national average. So black unemployment right now is 16.7%, right? So we're talking about all these service jobs being laid off. We're talking about the ripple effect of real estate as well. And Courtney, I know you're just about to go there, but I wanted to, to frame this up just a, a little bit. How should we be thinking about real estate going forward? So I, that's to kind of get there. So my concerns are on the real estate front is a couple. The first thing is, is that real estate, we were all, we were looking at the work from home idea. So one of the things that I know that we've had a conversation about when we're looking at REITs, which are real estate investment trusts, those are real estate companies that are traded on the stock market. But I share that to say, we always think like, oh yeah, corporate industrial always does well. Well, if people are going to start working from home, how does that change that particular subset of real estate? And, and I think it doesn't, I think it changes it for the worst. And we talked about this yesterday. We had a full conversation. Retail is getting hit, but we have a lot of retail REITs. So what's going to happen to them? Like, how are they, how are they going to fare? I think at the end of the day, what we need to look at is the industries that have the ability to pivot. If you have the ability, whatever you're doing to pivot, to be um, more functional in the space that we're in, that's the more success that we're going to have. So I think in terms of the industrial kind of corporate space, I think we're going to see um, a downturn there. Um, in terms of storage, I think we've had a conversation about real estate and storage. It was really hot for a while. And I think it's still going to be hot, but I think it's going to be hot in a different way. I think when people get a lot of stuff, they go to storage. But when people have to downsize, they have to go to storage. So I think you you may have two things going on at that time too. So I I think we are all over the place, but also, there's going to be a lot of room in healthcare. So it's going, the, the, the going, thing that, that's going to need that. storage. Oh, yeah. No, now healthcare is not the thing that's going to create the most storage, though. It's going to be tech companies needing more space for for their those big giant computer things. And then with the with the with, you know people might piss on cryptocurrency, but those those things need a lot of space and a lot of power. And so you're going to need spaces for those and, and, and companies are building a lot of infrastructure in that area. And so those those spaces are going to be still needed. They're going to be housing, you know, thousands and thousands of computers and 
and, so that, and, so data know, centers. Yeah. 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 That data centers and stuff like that. And so it's just going to be, like you said, who can pivot into that space and, and start to and warehouse those kind of things. Cause I don't think the health sector is the thing that's going to grow the most. I think it's going to be, um, I think it's going to be more the, 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 um, the, the, the data centers and stuff like that. Um, that's going to grow exponentially because of we're going to pivot more toward technology and and not and more human interaction. Let me jump in here real quick though. But to to Corey's point, right? I think, and I want to backtrack to, to Courtney's point also, right? Nobody mentioned hospitality. Nobody mentioned healthcare. I mean, not healthcare, hotels, right? So a lot of them are REIT centric. There's a lot of REITs in those. But going back to that, I don't think the healthcare REITs are going to get hurt that bad, right? We have all these senior livings. We still have over 10,000 people turning 65 every day. That trend is going to continue for a long, long, long time. And so I think there's still money to be paid, made and there's still staffing that's going to be needed um, in those industries now and businesses, right? There's all different kinds of opportunities there. But so Corey, I would, I, I believe data centers are, are, are going to come online, but I think that 10,000 Ten thousand person a day turning sixty five is still a strong theme. It's not just a trend; like it's a real theme. And I so is so is technology, though. Like we're moving more into the into technological age, and so we're. Oops. If you got more people living longer, you're going to need the data to 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 serve all of those people as they grow, as they you know. I mean, because you know you want people to grow with the technology, and right, so. We gotta, if you're, but we keep this in mind, right? We're talking about the black community. So everything we're talking about is through the lens of the black community and how many of us are positioned in tech to really take advantage of those to those opportunities. But that's the but point. that's the point. That's, that's the point. No, but that's right, but that's, <laughs> that's, that's exactly that's the point. point. How much that's where we should be positioned. How much training and how much uh, how much training and how many business opportunities will we be able to go after in that in that space but run a data center you don't need a super amount of training to run a data center you just need the space and then in the connections it's not about well the i mean you gotta we, so we, we, don't, we, we don't own those spaces right now right now we don't own those spaces that's the point the i'm trying to make though we should be yeah we, we need to own those start owning those spaces but because here's the thing right so as someone who looks at reits pretty much daily um I can't say, and let's keep it black on. So um, RLJ, um, Robert Johnson, the Robert former Johnson. Uh, founder of BC. So he has a read. And I know that his read is down about 50% since uh, COVID started, right? Because most of his holdings were in hospitality. On the flip side, um, there's REITs that uh, hold, you know, the properties, Corey, we're talking about, the data centers. They're down less than 1%. Yep. So um, I think the market is already, like, you know, seeing what's going to happen there. Like, how comfortable will you be going in, in, into a hotel? Like, how long will it be before you're comfortable staying at a, a, a hotel? You want the truth? I'm ready to go right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. I'm ready to go right now. I mean, let's say even, right, even, I mean, even the nicest hotels, even the nicest hotels, my wife, she stands outside. I go in there. I look for bed bugs first. So now I got to find COVID, bed bugs. I got to find, find everything before we go to the hotel. So it might take us like a little while. Uh, longer. I would actually. I would go into a hotel before I went to an Airbnb. That's for sure. Well, I'll, you I'll already to told me that you, you told me. Yo, Malik told me he ain't leaving the crib for the rest of the year. So we oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging tight. I'm hanging tight. I'm hanging tight. I'll be yeah. going to a hotel at the end of the month. Like I'm traveling. I'm out. I'm not. You know. I'm. I'm. I'm quarantined. I've been quarantined for the last three months, and you know my kids. But it's summertime. We go see our family in the summertime. We out. We gonna go see our family like we normally do. So okay, you know what I mean. I not that not that I'm gonna be you know not. I'm gonna change my routine a little bit because of the COVID thing, situations. But you know, we out. Like I'm not. I'm not gonna stop living. Because of, of what's going on with COVID, we gonna take extra. Well, you, you might. You might. You might stop living. I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you, see, you know yeah. what I meant, though. You 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 take this to a whole yeah. different, take this to a whole different arena. But you know what I'm saying. We, you know, because most of the most of the travel we do, we traveling by car. Like normally, we would fly, and so mm -hmm. we have changed the way we're going to travel. We're, right. we're driving. Right. But, but, but my flying. thing is like, 
uh, there there will be people that feel you the same way you do. But in terms of um, the space, we were talking about REITs and how the hospitality retail, like taking a bath. I think even worse than that have been the retail because retail was struggling, um, you know, leading up to this. And now to give an example, I know we have a lot of people from Philadelphia who are watching right now. Um, the Pennsylvania Real Estate Investment Trust, the one that owns, uh, I'm going to call it the gallery. I'm not calling it the fashion district. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> they own the gallery, Cherry Hill, Plymouth Meeting, and uh, all these, they own a bunch of malls, Willow Grove Mall. Their stock is down to less than a dollar right now, which is crazy. Like, if you know, it's less, it's literally less than the dollar to have ownership in um, the gallery. Uh, let's just say the gallery. But um, it's because what happens coming out of this with retail, right? And that's going to trickle down to, to small business, right? So you have big business taking a hit like that. It's going to always trickle down to small business. But what happens to retail, right? So there are black-owned retail spots um, around. How are they going to survive this? So I'm, I'm going to say this. Um, I think first and foremost, the, um, the, the smaller people need to get they just get the income stabilized and make some extra money just to right get through and then we can worry about helping them to build businesses like right now is this um company called uh, hood estates where they teach people to you know to own um logistics companies like without doing without getting the loads and hiring drivers you just have to own a truck and so they help people to build that business um, there's uh, Andre Hatch. I think you guys had him on by the hood. Andre Hatch, also a good guy. He's teaching people how to be mobile notaries so they can make uh, add to their income. And step one is stabilize. Make sure your income is still coming in. Stop buying stuff. And then we were about the reinvestment, right? But now, as far as the technology center goes, I mean, there's to what uh, so what Kamari to get into that. What we're saying is. It's not that difficult to teach younger people to code, right? The older people are stuck in their ways, a little bit different teaching them to code and teaching them some of the other technology things. But there's so many opportunities in technology. But Philadelphia just does not have that technology uh, culture. I mean, I was looking for it. You know, I was going to go. They got a space called uh, like Tech Lemert out in um in uh, Lemert. There's, there's Philly tech spaces. There's there's Philly tech spaces. There's there's one in the WeWork at at seven. No no no. I'm talking about I'm talking about I'm talking about a black tech scene. There's like I, again. There's one yeah. in it, it is well, there's one in the WeWork at 17th and Market. There's a black tech space uh, that our friend uh, uh Nyla Madison uh I forget okay. the name of the of the tech space, but her and she 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 worked there and I I've actually been there. And, and, and actually, Byron Woodson um, also uh, has been there, and I know they they're black owned in their tech space, and they help black people to get into the tech space. Okay. All right. So my so question is, my question is always, hold on, hold on, guys. Question, let let Malik finish his point. Right. No. 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 Well, okay. all I was saying is that so, quick, real quick, my tech space. I mean, like um, a tech gathering where they have. Um, the coding sessions or the crash code, whatever they call it, right? Like like a like a vector ninety type of space where everybody just come together. And I actually thought about and they have um in Oakland they have an event uh called Black and Tech. I forget what it's called in Oakland, but cool events. They have Afrotech, right? Crazy event. But so Philly, there's just nothing where there's, there's no whole community, black community. But the point is I was trying to make is that there's plenty of opportunities that are available. We just have to if, if it's not a if it's not happening, if you know the people that are in those spaces, I'm a real estate guy. I have vacant storefront right now, right? And I, I would absolutely go and buy other uh, commercial spaces that we could use and put in that space and build and build what they need. As a real estate person, I can provide the space. Wait, would... that, that was my next point. I'm sorry. Oh, no, uh, Jimmy's next. Go ahead, Jimmy. Oh, I'm sorry, Jimmy. Oh, no, all, all I was going to say is I always try to be solutions based. So my thing is Instead of saying, "Hey, we don't have like, how do we get like, what do we, what steps do we need to take to?" And you start laying that out. You have some spaces that you're willing to use, but I think that we should take it upon ourselves to start creating that. You know, we have a number of people between YouTube and Facebook right now listening to us that I'm pretty sure will be willing to help out. But it's it's time to me now to start doing like. So, what do we do to create those tech spaces that we need um, to start to get into 
uh, the, the the industrial spaces that will need data centers. Like it's time to start taking action as a group. So, Courtney, let me just jump in real quick and I'll come right back to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think some of those conversations should be had with people like um, the heck, her name is escaping me. Um, she's big in tech. Uh, Tiffany Standard is big in tech. Um, why is her name escaping me? Um, Miss Corbin. Uh, there's another young lady uh, who I know who's big in tech as well in this space um, and does a lot on a, on a high level as well. So I think we should start convening those conversations and from those from those conversations, develop action plans um, and like really get active right away. In our chat room, um, they said that the place you're talking about, Corey, is called uh, ITEM, I-T-E-M. Um, yeah, and it's Nyla item. Madison. Yeah, it's called ITEM. So I, I so ITEM is the name of the uh, what you're talking about, the tech space. Oh, there you go. You yep. put it up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Appreciate you. Okay. Shut up, Chad. What's Philly Zone? So here's the thing, and this is what I think we really need to talk about is, you know, we're always looking at tech to say, okay, what's the next new uh, coding language that we need to learn or teach our kids? But here's the thing. There's older people who know COBOL and like basic and some old behind languages that some of these servers actually run on. Like the state of New Jersey. Just about mm -hmm. most. Hmm? Just about most. Wait, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. I was just saying that not some. I'm just about most. I'm co signing you. I'm so, yeah. I think the question is, is that how can we redeploy the things that we already had in, in the space? I think instead of creating new, it's just kind of like retouching and figuring out what we have. So I was talking to somebody and they were, you know, they were in school in the 90s. And he was like, I know COBOL. And I was like, you do? And I was like, well, you should work in, for the state of New Jersey because they need you to help process their unemployment claim. So again, they're talking about stabilizing income. It's about using those old gifts and talents that you had that you weren't really sure why you had them, kind of dust them off and repurpose them. So I, I think, again, it's, we, we are such a talented community and we've had so many touch points with so many things. I think sometimes we're so busy focusing on what we can, what we did, what we can do tomorrow, as opposed to looking at what we did yesterday. And I also think about, you know, spending less. One of the big things about is getting back to basics. We, we were going off of, for years, we were saying, especially as a financial planner, when I was planning, I was always telling my clients, you need three to six months of expenses in an account. And then we kind of got away from that. We were like, ah, maybe not three to six months, maybe like three months because you have the availability of credit. And then we kind of got away from that even more. So again, to the point of COVID overall and looking at the African-American community, getting back to basics, growing our own food, you know, eating kind of off of, you know, eating a farm, eating off of the farm, you know, looking at, you know, kind of doing farm co-ops. I'm a member of, a, of the Weaver's Way co-op. Co I absolutely love it. But it's also looking at all those different opportunities that we used to do. You know, we used to do our hair in the home. We used to do a lot of different things in our homes and amongst each other that we're not doing anymore. And I think this is a time for us to kind of revisit, to, to actually cre recreate a foundation and then move forward from there. But, 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 but that, 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 goes, that goes to assimilation. So that, that goes to a whole different uh, set of circumstances talking about assimilation into the, the larger society, we lost our, you know, we lost our cultural things, the, the things that brought us together. And so, you know, the solution, the solution to that is the, is the, is to bring it back home. It, but, you know, when you say that to a lot of black people, they'll tell you, you know, how you have to be more, you know, more accepting of other cultures and all this other stuff. And this is about black wealth. Like the, the the other cultures have wealth because they they come together and they don't lose their cultural balance by assimilating, and that's that's the that's the thing that we don't do. I I, I would agree, but shifting just a little bit, right? This this topic has come up a couple of times tonight. Let's talk about health real quick. Um, a lot of times, a lot of times. Thing when you're ready. I did, I missed that, Courtney. I have the comorbidity uh, definition. It's the simultaneous, <laughs> simultaneous <laughs> presence of chronic oh, diseases the, or conditions. Shout out to the black women everywhere that just always got to dominate. Go ahead. What do you mean? What? I have been quiet this Wow. Week. Wait. Whoa, Eve. You like, Jeezy? She's, the, she's the Eve of the group. I saw that post. So here's my thing. Like, how is it? I mean, you're talking about health. And I was like, oh, I finally pulled it up because I didn't really know the exact definition. I have oh. 
the views yeah, of Kamari Ellis do not yeah, yeah. Uh, represent the views of yeah, yeah. 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 the views of Kamari Ellis what, what, are the views what, what, of Kamari Ellis. Said. What more he said? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. those are Kamari yeah. Ellis. Yeah. Now all of them, I didn't even say nothing. But his views are his uh, own. Yeah, and his also, views are his own, man. All we are not getting into that. And in all seriousness, right? Let's talk about health for a minute, right? We are seeing beef and chicken shortages, mm-hmm. right? And I'm not trying to be funny, but do you think this is a great time for us to look at, to really examine our diets? Because one thing I don't see is talk about a lot, and I saw Tracy talk about it, and Courtney brought it up. Shout out to black women everywhere. Y'all know I love y'all. Stop it. Cut it out. Right? <laughs> right? We don't know, Kamari. Whatever. <laughs> what Are we really ready to look at our diets? Because we don't talk about how health um, really diminishes the our wealth creation effect, whether it be high blood pressure, which you know I suffer from, whether it be diabetes, which is just or being overweight, not exercising, have food deserts. Like, are we really ready to make that change right now? What do y'all think? Well, I, mean, I, I think it just depends. You have to be, unfortunately, we have to be shocked into it. And I think, unfortunately, COVID should be a shock to us. But again, it, it doesn't really, it's a personal decision. It's a real personal decision. But I also feel that the standard American diet is not for us either. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree. I mean, I, tr- I try, but... You know, it's, it's tough. I mean, being raised a certain way, right, to turn that off, you know, and we definitely do some vegan meals and vegetarian uh, some nights. You know, I like to consider myself um, meatless, which means I eat less meat than I used to do, used to. Right. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I actually created a shirt I never put out. I created it like a month ago, two months ago, I never put out that I'm going to put it out. It says, um vegan to the weekend right so my thing is i just want to be a vegan you can put me in for one right now yeah, I'm, i gotta i gotta design vegan to the weekend right and so monday through friday vegan saturday and sunday i might have at it you know i mean i think i'm i personally i, I like eating rabbit i like lamb i don't want to give those things up but i do know i need to eat um healthier is it is it me Rabbit yeah. lamb that sounds very bourgeoisie. I'm really shocked. Really. <laughs> <laughs> no, we but have a comment. Know, we have a comment. You're Mr. Black Renaissance. Was say, shout out to uh Tracy um in our in our in the um chat. She says, in all seriousness, we have no choice but to look at our diet, so we won't be alive to distribute the wealth that we build. So exactly. uh, I think that's a great comment because yes. um you're right, like you know, it, it's a work, it's this difficult, it's a work in progress. I was telling you guys yesterday. How I got my Peloton, like so, you know, um, so <laughs> so I can have some movement while we go through COVID or what have you. But uh, you get um, money, money. We have no choice. <laughs> no, no, I'm poor, man. I'm I'm, I'm broke, baby. But uh, like, yeah, like, uh, like, 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 in my Mitch voice, I'm broke, baby. But no, Tracy's <laughs> point is, is is the exact point. Like we have no choice at this point, though. Um, that's another thing. One of the overall um, arching themes I'm seeing about this show is like um, with COVID, it should be a wake up call for a lot of things, I mean, whether it's, um, you know, health and wealth. So I think at this point we have no choice for both. Yeah. I mean, I know, I know diet, right? We know that our diet will kill us, but we're looking at a slow death is not as impactful as an immediate death, right? If you're dying in like three, four weeks, like, oh, shit, I got to do something about this versus like, bro, you got high blood pressure, you got diabetes, you got, you should change these things. But the medicine, medication gives us that false sense of security that we can still live for as long as we can. I mean, there's too many people, you know, dying early. You know, Andre Harrell just uh, passed away at, was it 51? Like, cra- like crazy numbers. John Singleton. 59. It- and like, yeah. like uh, John Singleton in, in his fifties, like these for whatever it was, I'm like, you know, we shouldn't be dying that early, and and we know for a fact it's like almost a hundred percent related to lifestyle, right? What are we What are we consuming? And for the most part, we consume a lot of sugar and yeah. a lot of salt. You know, just those two things. And if we could, if we could limit those two things alone, you know, even like meat is meat is whatever, but just the sugar and the salt. Cut those two things out, 
and it would be a lot healthier. Uh, so here's as, my as Dead, as Dead Press calls it dirty white girl. Um <laughs> go, go ahead, go ahead, Courtney. Go ahead. So, I've, so since August of 2019, I've lost 54 pounds. Congratulations. Oh, nice. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Me and my Peloton. <laughs> <laughs> okay, see. Okay. Oh, okay. I got I got a friend. I got a friend. I got a friend. I got a friend. I got a friend you on Peloton, so you know, can stay motivated. Yes, we can be friends on Peloton. So here's the thing, and I and I agree. Just run a Peloton funds, so we can all get one. I mean, yeah, you can get a hundred dollar <laughs> credit with my Peloton code. Oh, we, we don't want to like community crowdsource that, you know, and help help us unfortunate people out. Tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow, help us regular money people out. Right, exactly, Corey. <laughs> just just the PPP. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. Let me let me be brief about this, but. To Malik's point about sugar and salt. So sugar is the enemy. And salt, not so much. Salt is actually a micronutrient that you need. It's a mineral, yep. You need it, huh? I you die salt. So you, you need salt. So you do need salt in, in your diet. Now, do you need it in, the, in excess? No, but you do need some salt. So I think when we kind of have these conversations about salt and what, what it does and how it works, like, eh, it, it's still a necessary nutrient. So one of the things with the keto diet, it's, it's low carb, high fat, all of that. But I haven't, I don't eat sugar. And one of the things that a lot of people don't realize, and this is a conversation that's been going on in the medical community, is that um, high levels of sugar in your bloodstream, kind of pre-diabetes, will increase your, your blood pressure. So they, they usually, if you notice, some people are like, I have um, diabetes and high blood pressure. They usually kind of work together. The thing is, is that to the point about, hey, I'm like, I have meds and I can live longer. But the thing is, I looked at my family history. My grandfather had diabetes. He lost two toes. My grandmother had, had diabetes and she also had some kind of kidney issues. But on top of that, I saw their quality of life. So you have to learn from other people around you because if you can just reach out as an African-American, you can reach out in your family and see someone who is negatively affected by these particular diseases. And their lifestyle diseases to your right. so they, they can definitely be avoided and fit. So, but again, it's that you also have to make a change in your head. Like, I'm not going to do this. And sometimes you do need a, a really nice, scary thing that happens. So the doctor was like, Oh, you're pre-diabetic, and I'm putting you on high blood pressure meds. But, but that goes back to the food yeah. deserts, though. So right. that goes hold back, that goes on, back to the food deserts. Hold on. So I want to I wanna highlight this real quick. Uh Sharita Max. Yeah, I was about I was about to ask about that. Sharita, uh, because I'm about to say Sharita, what's the meal plan? Like, what's going on? So for, she says, for me, I lost 100 pounds. It took me 13 months. Shout out to you, Miss mm -hmm. Maxi. Between 2018 and 2019, I have so far kept it off. But I really had to do that hard examination of how the sad standard American diet mm -hmm. was detrimental for me. Again, uh, shout out to Sharita. Uh, Sharita. I hope I'm saying her name right. Right. I think so. But she also made a, a same point. She said, if you're eating all natural foods, you do need salt. See, and that's the thing. I eat a lot of natural food, so I do need salt. I have to add some salt to it, but I don't, you know, go overboard. But if you are using a lot of processed foods to the point of the food desert, those things that are shelf stable, they have a lot of salt in them or sodium to keep them shelf stable. So there's a lot of understanding that we have to know about our diets. But if we actually make our own food at the house, we won't have a lot of the problems that we have now in the community. Gotcha. And I see Sharita said the same thing you did, Courtney. She said um, keto. She also lost it with keto. So I'm going to need you and Sharita to send me some recipes because um, I'm, I'm going keto. But go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Yeah. To the, to the, but what I, the point I was making is, is that the food deserts are, are detrimental in our health, and which is what goes back to the point that Malik was making, is that we need to start creating our own food which with the aquaponics and the, and the farming. And so it, all, all of this stuff connects in a way, especially with the COVID thing going on, and it should shock us into into understanding that all of these things interconnect and intertwine. You know, not having, you know, not owning and eating processed food and not owning the farms and not being able to go farm direct and then not having the aquaponics and things of that nature and, and not, and you, and you know, not building these things. It's not that we don't have them, it's that we have not built them. It's, be, it's not, it's, it's because it's not like and already started talking about with a, a trillion dollars in wealth. It's not about wealth. It's about what 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 do we have in ownership, right? Spending power is one thing. Ownership is a whole different section. So like uh -oh. people talk. That's a whole other show. Yeah, no, but but he 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 started the show off talking about spending power, and that drives me nuts because spending power doesn't do anything for for black wealth because that's liquid. 
is about spending yeah. is about wealth. So what do no, we you're do absolutely right. Because because if you have spending nah, power, now nah, 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 we're not going to just glaze over that one real quick. So let me let me address okay, that. Okay, yeah, I got it. Right. So here's the thing, and and what drives me crazy is that we try to act like our spending doesn't affect our ownership, and so they have to be linked together, working together. That's the point I was trying to make. Hold on. Oh, that's the point you're trying to make. Yes, that's the, they have to be linked. It can't just be about spending power. It has to be about spending. But, it has to be about ownership power to go with that spending power. It doesn't mean anything. Okay, well, I thought that was kind of implied, so I'm glad you said that to break it down. So let me let me just be super clear, right? Because we spend our money in other communities, and we give our liquid cash, hard earned money to other communities, taking it out of our community, right? And what they do with that liquid cash, hard-earned money is they buy assets. They buy businesses, they buy real estate, they buy stocks, they buy international investments. They do all kinds of things. So to me, you know, Maggie Anderson did a wonderful book many, many years ago called um, uh, My Black Year, where she tried to spend for one year black, right? Forget about your mortgage and your car note, but everything else after that, she tried to it was difficult. A really hard time. And she was drugged through the through media and people said she was racist. Nobody else gets accused of that. Mm-hmm. Ironically, what I find interesting is that many people in our own community will call our folks, black folks, racist for trying to do that same thing that Maggie, oh, yeah. that Maggie was doing, which to me is crazy. But we'll we'll go, we'll go spend our money with listen, a, a white doctor, a white accountant a white lawyer, all of these other professions that are plentiful in our community. And it's known, right? So through Maggie's research, she said 1.2 trillion. Out of that 1.2 trillion, we only spend 2%. Now, I'm not going to say that is going to solve all of our problems, but Maggie says if we redirect that 2% and we make it 10%, it creates a million jobs overnight. That's powerful. That's not even that hard to do. The question is, why aren't we thinking that way in the first place? And so when I say 1.2 trillion, right, I'm saying, why aren't we spending that in our communities? So just so we're clear, right, because if we spend more in our communities and we make our businesses stronger, they can hire more people. They can buy more property. They can do more investments. They can invest in other businesses, right? Chipotle is taking off right now. It's been taking off for a while. You want to know one of the biggest investors in Chipotle was McDonald's. McDonald's was one of the biggest investors in Chipotle. So what happens when our bigger companies start to invest into our smaller, but in very promising companies that creates a whole yeah. infrastructure and, and, and uh, ecosystem. So I just wanted to clear that up. What, what were you no, I, I, your point is absolutely correct. I'm saying your point is correct, but I believe McDonald's gave up all their equity um, you know, before Chipotle really took off, because they actually they actually owned all of Chipotle, but they thought it was, they thought it was getting away of their core business, so they let it go. But that's either here or not. Your your point still stands, though. Your point still stands. Right, right. So that that's what I mean, Corey. But uh, no, no. I you know, as a standalone number, my point is as a standalone number, spending power means absolutely squadouche, and so <clears throat> it's about <laughs> where that spending, where that where that spending happens. And what the, I, I agree. It, and it drives, you know, if it doesn't drive ownership, if, if it doesn't drive our own communities, then it's just it's just a number that's just out in the ether. Like, and, and it doesn't it doesn't have an effect, a positive effect on our community. And we're talking about black wealth. So, you know, just just so when when people hear that standalone number, just you know, so that they understand that that number means nothing if it's not. Spent and it, you know, black spending power doesn't mean anything if it's all liquid and it doesn't bring us any, if it doesn't bring you know, prosperity to the community that is being spent from. I, I, I can't agree more. I can't agree more. So, we're running, we're running a little bit over, we're at an hour 20, right? So, as we start the wrap up, I want to know are there any questions, comments, thoughts, concerns, ideas, um, that the audience has for us? That you may want us to address. Um, and, and so no, I'm, I'm just reading. I'm reading in. A, I'm sorry. I'm reading in a different chat with different comments we have. Um, 
I guess my overall thing for for you know this this first show and and, and what we're talking about with the the people watching is just like you know let's be solutions based. That's all I want to say. You know, it's one thing to say what the problems are, but let's be solutions based. Okay, so uh, I won't say your name right. Jarvis Lawrence said. I know, Jarvis. Yes, I know Jarvis. Yes, that's the that's, that's uh, how you oh, say it. Thank you. I learned the value of the black dollar in the pandemic. My dollar will be intentionally spent within our own community. Thank you, Jared. That's dope. I, one other thing I would encourage you to do, let people know where you're spending at. Like, let them know. We got to we gotta make spending black cool. There's still so many people out here saying that I can't find a good black-owned business. Boggles my mind when people say that. But, Jared, I, I appreciate yeah. you for sharing that with us. Uh, this one is geared towards Malik. Malik's knows in our community we have barbers, hair salons, and daycares. The other businesses in the area are not owned by us. That's facts. They are. The they are well, we, at least we got we got the the laundromat on Baltimore Avenue. Um, you know, a couple other restaurants that are owned by us, but not everything else. And I, also, I think that um, a lot of times we kind of replicate what we already see. You know, like okay, so and so making money doing that, then I want to do that, and not really being innovative right to that next thing. But I got a couple of things I'm working on, Monica, and the neighborhood, and I think they're going to be um, they're going to be impactful. Hopefully, some people on this podcast right now will uh, contribute some some man hours or some dollars. To the that do. We kind of replicate. Let's go. Yeah, I'm on go. Okay, so Alicia Donnell Glover says, I think we deserve more credit. They built up that infrastructure over centuries. I'm not sure what perspective we're, we're talking about, though, Alicia. Are you talking about the black community, other communities? What are we talking about? And so she says, I see more and more black businesses every day. We are doing work, but it takes time. I, I agree with that. No, we, you know, we there are. are a lot of, there are a lot of black businesses out there doing business. There are a lot of black people out there, period doing the work and being fabulous. Shout out the black. It's a, it's a, it's a lot of black sole proprietors and not a lot of black employers. Yeah, I would Man, agree. That's, I a, mean, that's a great point. Most black, I, we can, most black on we could do a whole show. <laughs> we can do a whole show by my perspective on that too, Kamari. So I, I don't want to get into that. Right. So we, let's, let, let, let's save some of these topics for another show. Absolutely. Absolutely. So all right, everybody says great conversation. So um, as we wrap up, Malik, close us out with one thing that you need help with, support with, or you want everybody to pay attention to. One thing that I personally need help with? Sure, why not? I need help losing this weight. That's what I need help with. I need to get a Peloton. Man, I'm about, I'm about to say, I need some, I need some, I need some keto help. That's what I, what I found out about this is I need some keto help, man. All y'all keto out there in the, in the comments, man, help me out. What's popping? <laughs> Hey, listen, you can you don't need a Peloton, you can just start walking. Yeah, walking. man. I gotta make sure anybody outside first. I ain't trying to come in contact with no people. He said he ain't, he ain't leaving the house for the rest of the I, year. Listen, man. He told listen, you that already. I go I go outside, you know, a little bit, but I stay close to I play it close. I, it's, I got high blood pressure, diabetes. No, I, well, I don't have diabetes. Thank I me, mean, I'm not gonna wood, I have diabetes, but I do got high blood pressure. I got an autoimmune disease. No, thank you. I'm not going nowhere near the public for a while. Yeah, but you can go to a park and walk and run by yourself. No. You gotta get to the no. park. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Like I said, I mean, some of that stuff, I mean, you know, getting my bike, some of these things like I do, you're right, I do got to do, but also, you know, change my diet. You know, I actually, COVID, I came down a couple pounds, you know, not a lot, but, you know, I thought I was going to gain weight. But anyway, listen, I don't want to stay in the topic. That's my thing. I need, I personally need need help with that. And right, um, we're going we to create an accountability group for me. So he can lose some weight. Yeah, there you go. I met. Same question to you, Jimmy. What can we? Uh, Listen, what can I got we the I, I got the same answer. <laughs> um, for those for those out there, I want to say a couple of things. Though, first of all, I appreciate everybody who's tuned in and those that are watch afterwards. Um, make sure you check out what all of us have going on individually. So we're me and Corey are at by the hood. But um, in terms of personally though, I'm no, I'm serious. Like you know, I'm really trying to like learn. You know, I, I've been on keto before, but I was like fake keto. So I'm trying to like really. Stick to it and get my life right after hearing some of these conversations tonight. So, vegan to the weekend. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Same question. 
<laughs> so <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm tickled by this vegan to the weekend. So, um, <laughs> that means something. My legs on to something. I, I I don't know. I don't know. A lot of people do meatless Mondays, even if they're keto, they do meatless Mondays. So it's not like you know, it is what it is. So um, I am doing a month long stocks one hundred and one basics course. So that's kind of what I want people to know about what I'm doing. Um, you know, if you want to follow me on Peloton, I'm on Peloton and that's, that's that. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's really, it's the stock market program that I have for, it's going to start, I think it starts, it starts the first Sunday in June, which is like June 7th. So that's, that's kind of what I want people to know about. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> hey, hey, Courtney, Courtney, how did you that? just roll your one eye? Other eye didn't move. Only your one eye roll just now. Listen, this is, this is years of cultivation of... Just, just working the face, like because I, I used to have a mouth. I still have a mouth on me. But I used to get in trouble, so really? I would stop it. So I would actually just roll my eyes, um, and so I've actually found different ways to express myself in my face uh, without saying the word. Uh, that got me in trouble in court because I, I know from the bench they said, uh, "Counselor, you didn't like my ruling, did you?" <laughs> I'm like, oh, you know. You know I appreciate, you know, what you do, and, and I just try to shuffle out the court. So, yeah. So, Courtney, where can they find your course? The course is um, on my Instagram. So, it's it's like the first link of the Instagram. It's uh, My Instagram is the Ivy Investor, doc, is Ivy Investor on Instagram. And it's also probably going to be on the website, but it's not there yet because my team hasn't put it there yet. Um, but it's it just literally dropped today. So, it's that's where we are. Tell us on Instagram. Go find it on Instagram. You can find it in my link tree. Okay. Corey. Uh, what I need help with, uh, I just need somebody to, to, to <clears throat> the accountability partner for, for exercise. Like, I do a little bit of exercise. I get up and down. I walk around. I get in the sun. You know what I mean? But uh, I'm stationary. Like, I'm teaching all the time and I'm doing so. I need somebody to make me move. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, need, I, need, I need to do something more that's not so sedentary so i need an accountability partner to make me go run or do something like because to be honest if if i if i gotta do it on my own it's gonna take forever it's, it'll get done it'll just take forever to do um so you know i need somebody to, to, to ring my phone and, and, and say get you, you know get your fat ass up and move and don't talk to me <laughs> dirty. if you talk to me regular i'm gonna ignore you so, all right that, that's a bet so it seems like the team here um, with the Black Wealth Project will kind of be its own accountability partner along with the audience in the, in the Black Wealth group. Um, so, yeah, we'll just start telling you to get your ass up and go move. That's easy. Yeah, that's, yeah, easy. that's, that's, yeah, that's the easy one. All right. All right, everybody. As we close out, uh, again, I'm Kamari Ellis. We have Corey Kemp. We have Co uh, Courtney Richardson, Jimmy Williams, and Malik Carter. We are the Black Wealth Project. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight on our first big major um, uh, broadcast tonight. A couple of things. I just want to give a shout out to Aisha Sheldon, whose book dropped. Somebody just put that in the uh, the chat. I think that's dope. We're yeah. all about supporting Black, faces, Black on authors, yeah. Black on uh, investors as well. So I, got, I got my copy. You got your copy? I'm yeah, I got my it. copy too. Got my copy too. It's fire. Yeah, yeah the I mean, e-book is fire. Here, right. Mud the Millionaire. What'd you say? It's called Mud, Mud the Millionaire. Called Mud, Mud, yeah, yeah, Mud okay. the Millionaire. And All also right. check out, check out, and by the way, check out Aisha, um, as well as Kamari and Malik have all been on By the Hood podcast, right? So there's only one person that, that's up here that hasn't been on yet, Hint. And but, she's um, coming. You know, just want to put that out, <laughs> she put that out there. Just want to put that out there. <laughs> shout out to Aisha, right. though. So also another shout out to Mosaic. That was our featured Bob of the week. So everybody be sure to check out Mosaic. Uh, Building contractors, I believe they're called our building development here in Philly, black owned development team. So check them out. Um, I, I know they have some rental property. I don't know what they got going on now, but either way, check them out and spread the word about them. Um, last thing for me, what I would like to ask help with is could everybody just go follow by the hood, excuse me, follow by the hood, but also go follow the Black Wealth Project, <laughs> the Black Wealth Project on Facebook, the Black Wealth Project on YouTube. In the Black Ball Project on IG, Instagram. Until Absolutely. next week, all right. We'll be back next week, 7 p.m. Same Black Ball Project time, same Black Ball Project channel. I'll see you all then.
Peace. Peace.